Jean Griska, who was the daughter of uh, Joseph and Gertrude Becker, who established the Great Oaks Camp. And so Jean and I tumbled down to Scarborough yes, this winter, late, late winter, I guess, and visited. And Jean brought a big box of um, material that she collected over time from generous donors. And we went through it with Jean Griska and Lynn, her daughter. Where is Lynn gone? Karen. Karen, sorry. Uh, and uh, we went through them and had some recall of memories and had a good visit. So it was delighted. G came up from Scarborough just for this. Uh -huh. uh, Karen is here and her son, Kat, and her, her granddaughter, Katie. Hi, Katie. Hi. 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 <laughs> uh, so we're delighted to have you all here. I also would like to just uh, assess the crowd a little bit and see who is here who worked at Great Oaks Camp, Camp in some configuration or other. Um, and how many, just put your hands up for now. We'll get back to you later because we want to hear from you a little bit. Then more than that. Okay, people are being shy. <laughs> is going to walk through a PowerPoint presentation of some nice pictures and some uh, recall memories of Great Oaks Camp. Okay, I have no connection with Great Oaks Camp except that when I went to church uh, in the summers when we were here, we would, uh, everyone would sit in the back, all 20 of the regular parishioners would sit in the, sit in the back and uh, it, the, the bell, the church bell would ring and we would have this long procession of uniformed, essentially uniformed, young boys, some of looked like they were four years old, come screaming into the church. It, it happened Sunday after Sunday. It was just the highlight of the summer service at the East Otisfield Free Baptist Church. Uh, we, we learned afterwards that most of them weren't Baptists at all. Some of them, in fact, were Jewish. But um, <laughs> if, if the Catholics went to, uh, went to Oxford and the, everyone else went to the East Otisfield Free Baptist Church. Okay, um, that's not what I'm going to talk about to begin with. But I want to point out that Great Oaks Camp was very much like the other summer camps in, in Otisfield. We've had very, uh, we are very fortunate to have had so many uh, good camps for children on our lakes, on Pleasant Pond, Thompson Pond, and this is the only one, as far as I know, that was ever on Saturday Pond. Uh, like the other camps in town, this was founded and maintained not by a corporation, but one, but by one family, the Becker family, and Jean Driscoll's husband took over, and she took over. So it's one family that's running, and this is true of the other uh, family camps, notably Powhatan and Acadia, who also have generations of one family uh, directing the camp. That gives it a lot of stability. Uh, secondly, most of these camps in Otisfield, summer camps, were founded in the 1920s. Uh, this, this camp, Great Oaks, was found open in 1927. Most of the others also opened during that decade. That was kind of the heyday of youth camping. Another similarity between this camp and the others is that a lot of the emphasis was on education, physical education, because the directors came from schools, private schools or colleges. Uh, when Ethel Bean Turner and I did the survey of Pleasant Lake camps, we found, for example, a strong connection with Columbia University where several of the camp directors had gone and known each other and been part of the physical education. Uh, and that's true, true of Great Oaks, which is uh, directed by people with strong connections with uh, uh, secondary schools in New York City. It was like the other camps in town, it was founded on, not out of a vacuum, but on a, farm, a former farm which had generations of Otis Fielders living on it. 
changing its use to a camp was a profitable thing and it also was a lifesaver for some of these early people in Otisfield it's on the eve of the Great Depression. It saved a lot of families from what was to be close to bankruptcy. It drew, uh, for its campers, it drew not the rural kids. Farmers' kids did not go to any of these camps or to Great Oaks. They got their kids from, a lot came to the schools where the directors taught. Others came from places like New York City, out in suburban New York, as they did at Great Oaks. Another similarity between these camps was that they, they did not bring their workers with them. They got their workers from Otisfield, by and large. Occasionally, they would might bring some counselors up from New York, but most of the people who worked on, on the camps came from Otisfield. Again, this was a big boom to a town which dropped down to a population of 450, 450 people in Otisfield in the 1940s. I think I'm right on that. But there were a couple of differences. Gray Oaks had a couple of things going for it that the others didn't. One of the things that really struck me was that I learned that the, the ratio of campers, of counselors to campers was one to four. One counselor for every four campers. And I think that's remarkable. And I don't think the other camps ever came close to that. Another difference that I realized just today was that these boys were really uh, exposed to a Spartan atmosphere. No electricity, no running water in these camps. As I understand it, it was for the whole time of the camp, which lasted from 1927 to 1984. Uh, no running water, no electricity. I asked Frank Blogger who was there a lot, who was there both as a camper and counsel. Well, did you find this kind of tough? You came from New York City, you know, a well-off family, and you're thrown in this little, this little hot with, with none of the conveniences. He said, it was wonderful. <laughs> so, okay, those, and those are two of the big differences. One other difference um, that I found was that um, they may have had more, more, trip, more trips away from the camp than other, the other camps did. I'm not sure, and I'm throwing that out. <coughs> I've been hearing about these trips. Again, Frank Blavelt was director of many of them, canoe trips, climbing trips, in simply um, out, of, out of state, out of, out of the country. They had one big trip to Quebec. We're going to see a slide of that. Okay, see if I can make this thing work. Okay, this is the first, earliest picture I have. This is the Great Oaks Main Lodge, before the Breckers owned it. This is, it was called Keene House. Sometimes it was called Keene View House. And it was owned by Fernald L. Keene, who bought it in 1885. It started out as a, as a typical New England farm, and um, by 1920, someone realized that it would make a great tourist hub. Another way to make money in the, in the Depression, or the, close to the Depression. So it became a tourist home under the, uh, called Keene View House. And then it was sold to Grace and Arthur Wales. I don't think they had many rooms without out. Someone said maybe three or four rooms. Okay, here's a here's an even fancier picture of, again, I'm quite sure this is in the days before the Beckers took over, because I don't think the main lodge in the, uh, at Great Oaks Camp ever had the canopies and the painted rocks. It doesn't look like a camp, and, and Jane Frisker is agreeing with me. Uh, it looks like a, tur a, a fancy tourist room. Okay. Now here are the, here, uh, the power. Here is the advertisement for um, coming to the King, the King House, the tourist hall, before it was a camp. This is probably the early 1920s. And I, I think you can, it's a kind of a poor copy, but I think you can read that uh, uh, some of that beautiful 
my beautiful lake, 900 feet from the house, with fishing, bathing, one mile frontage on the lake. Uh, nearest we have Oxford, eight miles of Camp Fernwood, which of course was a girls' camp. Um, I don't know if that's a good uh, Six miles of Camp Sondo. Maybe they're trying to uh, entice parents of campers to come there. And ten miles to South Spring, Spring Hotel is, I think that is Pope Spring. Yes. Yes. Okay. And here are the directions. These directions are pretty wonderful. Uh, I can't, I can't follow them, uh, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's something very strange in the bottom of it. You, the turn, turn shot, left. Yeah, yeah. It's a Kamakwa Library. Kamakwa Library was the library established by Eva Elliott of the Cape in what is now the Community Hall. Uh, I don't think there's any big sign that said Kamakwa Library, but. Uh, okay, and again, I want to emphasize that before, before the Packers owned it, a lot of other people did it. This is an old New England farm. Samuel Hammond, in 1780s, was the first owner, and then someone named Samson, Grinzel Blank, Thomas Shute, and Henry Holden, I think, built the house. I am not certain of that. Uh, but according to Spurs history, after the house burned, he built a new one. And I think, so I think that house escaped the lot. I think, Jane can disagree with me on this, I think it was built 1855 to 60. She's shaking her head. I don't know. Okay, she doesn't know me. All right, I'm safe. <laughs> and then the, the last owner before the Beckers was, was A.G. Wales, who owned the, who owned the King View House in Madison Church. Okay, and here actually is the uh, brochure showing the cameras at the can. Um, this is a pretty good statement of the philosophy with which the camp opened in 1927. I will say that when the camp opened, Joseph Becker was still a young man. Were you even, were you born then when it opened? Not, I was born in 25. Okay, <laughs> but it's a young family, and the year before, uh, before the camp opened, he, in Ogisfield, he owned a camp in the Adirondacks, yeah. which was called Great Oaks, because it had a lot of giant oak trees. It turned out that the Ogisfield property had no giant oak trees. <laughs> 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 And this is a picture of the of the main lodge. Uh, no, no awnings on the windows now. And you can see that it shows the dining new dining now off on the left side. Kelly helped me put this together uh, because I that's don't about, that's the, as I remember yes. when I worked there as a little dishwasher girl, yeah. and that was probably uh, early 50s. And I had some cohorts that were there too. Uh, <laughs> That's how I remember it at that point. Mm -hmm. That was probably grand building at that point. That, uh, the dining room? Yeah. 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 Oh, they just, okay. And then this front was a oh, porch, okay. porch, and then you went into the left was the office. Right. And then on the right there was, uh, I can't remember what that space was exactly, maybe it was all office. It was all office. And then you went on through and down a couple of steps into the dishwashing area and then into the uh, kitchen right. right about Gladys Freeman. And then and his did your family live in the main lodge or did you live in one of those cottages? No, we lived in the main lodge. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay, and this is Joe Becker and his staff. I don't have a name on that picture. I'm not even sure where it came. We have one of those yearbooks. Okay, and this, after this is a fairly modern picture. I think I took this in 1998. I consider that quite modern. And this is of the cabinets that were left at the time. Uh, Frank Walkout informed me that there were also some tent platforms. I don't know how many of those. Do you remember how many of those tent? There were four. We had 
We had 17 cabins, three wide cabins. Okay. And then we added tents as the, the population of boys required. Mm. And the mm -hmm. tents were old Army and, eight, and Marine surplus uh, mm -hmm. six man tents mm -hmm. that sat on a platform and they had screens all the way around except for the door, which always made a problem at night. Was that? The bugs still came in. Was that the place to stay? The champ or was the cabin? The cabins were better to stay. <laughs> Older boys got to stay in the tents. But that was when the camp closed. Earlier in the camp, they had 10 cabins and then the rest were tents. And they kept adding, we kept adding cabins on as, a, okay. as we. Thank you. And um, maybe uh, tell us about <coughs> the inside of the cabins were just snacking. I'm going to get to that. One more picture. Oh, one more picture. <laughs> This is the one we're talking about. Yeah, and how we can tell us more what went on in the tents and what didn't. Um, <laughs> 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 what happened in the facilities and the first and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, all, all, the, the, all the cabins and tents held six cots. So generally, you'd have a cot for each cot. Yeah. And then you'd have another cot for each cot. Yeah. 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 Well, that was a, that's pretty neat. And <laughs> <laughs> did you feel deprived? It's kind of like China. Pardon me? Did you feel deprived? No. Okay. Um, All right. Now, yes, yeah, I heard that question. 